Hello there guys, we had a small technical issue, so I'm gonna re-record the last uh, game versus uh, Demia Merxad and uh, the final against uh, Boros Agro here. But we were just uh, heading into the game and we had a technical falling out right when he used uh, Otavara to bounce my Harbinger. Uh, back to hand, uh, alleviating all his lands. And we were just talking about we can't sink into Stuber the Otavara since Otavara is uh, uh, it's a channel effect, so you simply discard it so you can counter that kind of spell, but but um, this alleviates uh, all his mana, so he can start doing stuff again, and we can see he plays the uh, Psychic Frog. We can solve the Psychic Frog, which is kind of nice, because um, uh, now we get the subtlety in play, which is a good threat. Uh, he puts it on top, and uh, we pass the turn here. So here we uh, then can Replay, we can start by exiling the Pulu Delta with Relic. We can replay, we can attack and we can replay the Harbinger. But we also drew a Type Band, which is a nice draw. But we still want to just play out the Harbinger, consider that at least. Yeah, notice here that he did not crack the Flutter Strand. And the reason why it's really nice in this specific occasion to play the Harbinger uh, before uh, the, the holding up Type Binder is because we know that he has a Psychic Frog on top of his deck, so he's not. Uh, he doesn't really want to crack his Flutter Strand at the moment. And by playing the Harbinger, um, now the Flutter Strand becomes an island, so it can't be cracked in future turns. But anyway, he does have a Toxic Deluge. We can sing into Stuber. And notice that he does not have black mana, so this is a great play. So we can replay it in this turn at least, but he does have a Spell Pierce. So um, yeah, good play by him. And he can clear the board and play his Psychic Frog being on zero cards here. And we do have a tight binder. Um, we draw the Harbinger, and actually there's a consideration here for what's the right line. Either you want to use the Harbinger, which is the normal traditional way of doing it, bouncing the Psychic Frog when it attacks. But I actually think that's what we're going to do, but I actually think in retrospect it's better to tight binder the activation for the Psychic Frog. But here we don't want him to draw and we choose the high Harbinger, but I think maybe Tight Shapering here would have been better, then he would have had a 1-2 with no abilities, um, and he does have two Psychic Frogs. Zero cast in hand with two Psychic Frogs, and now I think it's time to crack um, crack the for the cards here. Flare the Island is a fine card, and we actually just want to trade with one of the Psychic Frogs, that's absolutely fine here. Uh, and now we have Flare the Nile up, we have Tide Binder up, and we have Muda Vault to attack next turn. Um, so does he want to attack? He does, and now I think we go for the Type Binder play. So it goes in the stack, and now we play the Type Binder, and he chooses to concede. Let's go to the final. Okay, we are in the final. Uh, we have a fine hand. Uh, we can play out the Type Tiber, but in the dark we don't want to do that. We don't know what we're up against, and we are up against Giganto. We can see so that might as might be a, a deck where we want to. Uh, have the option of um, of playing the Tide Shaper to, to destroy some mana. But this is Boros Aggro, and this card, Ocelot Pride, is one of the best cards that has been printed for uh, from Modern Horizons 3. It's an engine in itself, it's a 1-1 one, one first strike lifelinker, and uh, every time you get life, and then the turn you actually create a 1-1. One, one. Um, so this deck is so strong and one of our hardest matchups, and we really need to be be aware of what we do here. I actually think this is just a really tough matchup. So um, we can try to get him off red, so he can't lightning bolt, but he does have another red source, and I was kind of expecting that. This means that now he can hit in with his Oslo Pride, and he can even play a second one to create another cat token, because the trigger uh, comes twice. We don't manage to draw a blue source, so now we try to go for the defensive line of Mood Evolving, but he has an Amp Raptor. Um, and he can play a journey of that. And Embred, we talked about that earlier, what a card. And this means that actually now he can use his energy just to play the Ajani. And uh, this Ajani is uh, maybe the second best card after Oslo's Pride. And also it fuels up the Oslo Pride because when you have Ajani in play, it feels like all your cats are unblockable because you never, I don't want to block and kill off a cat. So this flips because it's really, really strong on the Planeswalker side. It, it does create a cat itself, but these are also, are also cats. So this is just such a strong card. And look how uh, much card advantage and the card engine, everything in the Boros Agro deck are just two for ones. That's why it's a hard matchup because we have a lot of where we two for one ourselves in the tempo. And, um, and Boros Agro can both play fast, it can play slow and controlish. 
and it does have a lot of two for ones for card advantages. Notice here that he can play a red source, so when he uses a, a Johnny activated ability, it can also deal damage and kill off the Muda Vault. We can't do anything about that. Crazy strong. Yeah, let's go to the game. Go to game number two. Um, okay, so um, let's see if we draw here. Bad hand, we mulligan. And this hand is uh, suitable, and we just put back um, the cavern. The reason why we want to put back cavern is because uh, they have no counter spells uh, and cannot cast um, a singleton stupor, so it's fine to just remove that one. We play out a tight shaper because he might have Regaman. Not the best line, but um, we can also then flare of denial something if that comes up. He does have a guide uh, of souls, which is also one of the most important cards in the deck. This fuels the deck because every time he gets a creature to enter, and they do that a lot, they don't. Uh, they both get life and an energy counter. So this is a way of just accum uh, accumulating a lot of energy, which they can use later, later in later turns. Um, so what we do here is that we. He's at 17, he shocked himself with March Flats. Every point of damage counts. So even though this is a 1-2, I choose to attack in with the Tide Chipper. And this is simply because I know the importance of this card. He knows that I have um, Hex Catcher in the deck, the flash ability of, of pumping this up, meaning that I think it's correct for him not to block. So I try to fake him here and he chooses not to block and we get in the point of damage, which might make sense in the future. But it's kind of a gamble, but you have to play, play a bit aggressive in this matchup, right? Okay, so he plays down a Johnny, and this is one of the things where it's such a good card, uh, and he can run away with the game really fast. He'll get uh, triggers, two triggers from this as well. So I think it's the correct line just to get it out of there with the Flare of the Nile, even though we're giving him a two for one. But we just have to stop the pressure. Um, we draw a land, which is not the best, but we do have a tight binder up and running. Uh, we can cast and sell it to next turn. So we are ready here. He's gonna attack. Um, into my Muda Vault, which signal, signifies for me that he has uh, maybe a removal spell and anything like that. And I don't want to uh, do anything crazy like activating the Muda Vault, getting it killed, so I can't play the Tide Binder, uh, or playing the Tide Binder to block the opponent damage doesn't really matter. Um, because he also played a Marsh Flats, and I much rather want to interact with that uh, trigger with Tashana's Tide Binder. So now uh, we can we can get that out of the way. He can unfortunately stomp um, with Bunker as a giant, but we do uh, cancel his mana. And now we draw a land, so we can have subtlety up. Um, and now we are again in a position of, of we have to choose our um, how to use our cards correctly here. We'll just give him the damage. We don't want to put in the subtlety to try to block here. He doesn't have anything, but we just wait patiently. Another move vault. Uh, this is actually fine because now we can actually activate and still uh, cast subtlety um, and I think he's going to stop attacking now uh, and he doesn't seem to draw another lane so it was really nice that we do, did that and now we can play out the Harbinger uh, but uh, but again right now he has so many removal spells four Gavanic charges uh, a Gavanic discharge and um, so I don't want to run out the the Harbinger into uh, removal He's gonna play a threat here. This is the Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Fable of the Mirror Breaker is in general a really, really good card. It's not at its best uh, in this deck, and actually because it's such a strong deck, they have Flake, the three mana, burn three, uh, gain three, and that comes back from the graveyard. They have Oslo's Pride and Ajani and all the uh, Amp Raptors and stuff like that. But it's still a really potent threat here, and I don't want him to go up here uh, and be able to cycle through his cards. So this is the right time to uh, sing it stupid this, also because now he's tapped out and my Harbinger can create value now. Um, so here, uh, this is a good draw because I can then start with Adept and then play Harbinger, and now he's only down to two planes. And it's such an important factor to keep him off red mana because eight of his uh, one mana removal spells for Harbingers are the Lightning Bolts and the Galvanic Discharge, and then they have the one mana um, white removal spell, uh, which I can't remember the name of, but that's the one that's just gonna be an Oblivion Ring, but then it ticks off a point of energy every turn. But they typically only play one, two, three, maybe some people are playing four, but typically it's, it's a lower priority because it can't go to the dome. Um, that's why I'm willing to gamble that he might have that, 
to but but to take him off right here. He he plays a Mariot Mesa, which is not something you use that well, and then he puts the Gigante into hand. Perfect for us. And now we can start putting pressure on and start attacking. We can play the either Vile still handling up Solity and to Shannon's Tide Binder. And he have no plays here. So this is looking good for us now. We draw Adept, which is uh, considered, but also Solity is so strong right now, so um, I think it's better to wait because the Edervile is going to go up to two anyways next turn. And now he plays the Ajani. This is a great situation for Subtlety. We want to get the Ajani uh, uh, out and also the Subtlety being a 3-3 three, three, three flyer right now is really strong. So let's get that out of there. He never was able to replay the, the Giant because of Harbinger, the power of Harbinger. What a great card. And now we even draw the master here, so we can play that one out, and we securely won that game. Uh, yeah, let's go to the final. We're one on one in the final game of Modern League, and now we can see if we can uh, manage to win it. So uh, here, uh, he's on the play. No Oslot, uh, no Ragaman. That's nice. Really good for us. Um, we uh, have not the best hand, but uh, again, I don't like to mulligan too aggressively, especially. Since they have a lot of card advantage, or they have a lot of two for ones, and we uh, we have a lot of uh, two for one ourselves. Here he plays out the Ragaman dashed. We can't do anything about that. Um, maybe he just drew that. Otherwise, I think it's weird that he does not play it on turn one. But anyways, Ragaman comes in, and now let's see the sideboard tech here. So what's in interesting is that one of the things that's uh, for me important in uh, sideboarding is also to see when is uh, Chalice great Chalice of course historically one of our best sideboard options especially against Cascade decks but um, don't sleep on uh, Chalice for one especially against a deck like this it's so streamlined uh, streamlined the Boros Acro deck they got four Ocelots four Ragavans they got four Lightning Bolts four Cavalier Discharges even the O-Rings for one so we are talking here 16 up to 20 one mana spells um, this means the Chalice of the Void is really strong, and what is it actually hitting on our end? Yeah, the Either Vials, but we are never... Uh, that's something that happens, but it doesn't... The Either Vial is best, playing at 1 anyway, uh, and the Chalice is going to come out on 2. Um, and the Tide Shaper, we can then use Kevin of Souls to make sure it's not countered. So getting that Chalice out here right now is important, uh, because then we can eliminate a lot of the potential uh, dangerous cards from him. Uh, protecting our own creatures. He plays the Amp Raptor. Uh, great card here. Uh, but look here, he hits the Ragavan, which gets instantly countered. Um, he plays the Sacred Foundry, and he can play that Jani. We can't do anything about the Jani, so actually, great turn by him. He processes. He is progressing his board. But I'm not too worried uh, at the moment, because we have the Chalice, which means that we can protect our own threats a lot better. And here the Harbinger is a perfect play, because uh, now we are again uh, making sure that he can cast his spells, and yeah, we might take some damage, but as, so as long as we don't get a Jani to flip, uh, we are satisfied. We are an 18, so we can easily take the four, four point of damage, going to 14, absolutely fine, doesn't really matter. And he can't really play anything, so it just goes to us. We draw a land, which is fine, uh, and now we got some options. First of all, we are going to play the Adept, and then we can play the Harpinger. So what are we bouncing with Harpinger? This is the question. Many people would probably bounce the Cat Warrior token, uh, and that is a great play. That's absolutely fine. But the first strike on Embraptor is going to be relevant here. We don't have any Lords, and everything here can be stopped if he just stays back and block right now. We might draw a lot, yeah, but we don't know that. That's why I actually think it's better to bounce the Amp Raptor. He has no red sources to replay it right now. And then just uh, hammer in here. And we can even sink into Stupor the token at a later stage. But now we got the chance to do a really efficient way of, of getting the Amp Raptor back into his hand. So we're just going to pass here. He can replay the Raptor. So he's just going to attack with the Cat Warrior. And we're not going to block. No, 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 no. Because then he can flip it and kill the Harbinger. And now we're back to our turn with another Harbinger, and we're just gonna attack in with everything. Now we are really putting the pressure on. And here I think it's the right thing to play the Merfolk. We even draw a land, so we have both Tidebinder and Sing to Stupor up. He's gonna play the Guide of Souls into the Chalice and be so frustrated, he's gonna concede the game. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, a win, a trophy with Modern Merfolk. So, nice of you to watch, and uh, have a great day.